This morning, I want to read to you an article, first of all. And um, this came out on April the 24th, 2012. Now, you all have your favourite Bible teachers and preachers and pastors all over. I'm sure you listen to people on the internet and you've got your own books. If I went to your house and looked at your library or your section where your books are, you can tell sometimes what kind of Christian you are by the people you read. And if you come to my house, you'd say the same thing. One of my favourites, as you know, is Peter Rockman. I think the guy is a genius. I, I personally don't know of anybody that's ever gone deeper in the scriptures than this guy. And um, he's now 94 years old, and he's coming to the end of his life, and... God willing, he'll see the rapture. Hopefully we all will very, very soon. But I've never spoken to him on the telephone. I've never met him. Um, I've corresponded with him on a number of occasions. I don't actually know how many, perhaps seven times we've written to each other, something like that, five or seven times over the years. Uh, But I've read a lot of his work. But I sent him a letter, and um, because we were coming up to the Time for Truth News issue 60, and it was like a little bit of a you know, um, what's the highlights in there? Landmark. That's the word, thank you. He speaks better English than I do. Um, landmark. But, <laughs> yeah, thank you. And um, so I asked him, um, I sent him a letter and asked him whether he'd like to contribute an article to our um, newsletter. I wasn't really expecting to get a response back, but he did. And this is what I want to read to you, and I think this is fascinating. This is a man who is totally open, totally honest, and very, very raw. See what you think to this. He's put, Dear Brother Davis, I'm getting the material you've been sending and appreciate it very much. It is very valuable. You are one of the few true blue King James men that is left in England. I got your invitation to write an article to contribute to your publication coming up. You wrote... He could put whatever he likes in it and choose his own subject. We wouldn't edit a word. Or he could pick any of the following titles. That's what I sent to him. You can do whatever you want. Just give us an article. The list of the titles you sent could go anywhere from 10 pages to 120 pages. So I thought I'd answer each one of them as shortly as I could to give you the information. The first thing you suggest is, so this is my first point, number one. Looking back, the most important thing that he has learned, what was it? He writes, The most important thing that I have learned is that I am not able to guide and con- conduct my life intelligibly, intelligently. I thought that was an excellent answer. I'm not able to guide and conduct my life intelligently. Only God can. I do not have the wisdom to know what's good and bad for me. But he does. I thought that was brilliant. Number two. If you had your time all over again, I sent to him, he's put, if I had my time all over again, I wouldn't have looked at some of the dirty stuff that I looked at and would not have done some of the pornographic sketches and stuff that I did before I got right (coughs) with the Lord. Number three, the authorised version to me, that's what I sent him, the question, the authorised version to him, he's put, nobody taught me the authorised version was anything. I learned it by reading it. A stolen copy at that. I stole it out of a drunk's room when I was under conviction and going to the Catholic Church. I learned the Bible by myself in dealing with it, arguing with it, fighting with it, and going against it. While doing this, I lost about five pounds a week for four weeks. I saw that thing say things that could not be taught in any school in the world. By the time I went to Bob Jones University in 1952, I had read it through six times. As a consequence, when I came in there, without knowing it, I was loaded for bear. I've been loaded ever since. I have had no one help me. The people who try to figure out who taught me what I believe have never been able to decide anything except either God taught me or the devil taught me, because I couldn't have learned it any place else. Nobody in my home was a Bible believer. Father, mother, brother, sister, uncle or aunt. Nobody at the University of Alabama, where I went to school, ever talked to me about any version of the Bible. 
Nobody where I went to school at Kansas State Agricultural College told me anything about the Bible. When Hugh Pyle led me to Christ, we didn't discuss the Bible itself at all, or any version at all. What I learned, I learned reading it through 150 times. Number four, the hardest part of my life, the hardest part of my life for me has been, he's put, this is Rockman's answer, the hardest part of the Christian life for me has always been to keep my eyes on Jesus Christ and remember that I must give account of myself to God and nobody else. You are always dealing with people and getting mixed up with people in all kinds of mix-ups. For example, I've been taken to court four times. I've had my life threatened two or three times, and a loaded weapon were involved. With those things going on, it's awful hard to keep your mind on the Lord. But that's where I know it should be. Number five, what I could change if I could? Peter Rockman answers, the answer to that is very simple. I wouldn't change anything I'm doing right now, except I could do it better if God give me some eyesight. If I could change anything right now, I would want my eyes changed so that the macular degeneration doesn't get in my way and I could do the reading I used to do and the writing I used to do and the painting I used to do and could get enough of my youth back so I could still play hockey and throw a mullet net. I can, I can do none of those things. I would change all of them if I could. Number six. About getting serious with God. His answer. I've always been serious with God since I came to know him. And it was knowing him that scared the fire out of me and got me saved to start with. I've always considered from, the, from that day forward that he is the final authority in all matters of faith and practice and that he has given me a book that I can look at, that I can look to as the absolute authority in all matters of faith and practice. I put number seven, the Lord and Dr. Peter Ruckman. Ruckman writes, the answer to that is that I call myself the Lord's junkyard dog. I consider myself to be a servant of God, period. And that is it, that is all. On my desk is a wooden plaque sent to me by Christians in the Philippines. It sits on my desk in my office and says, Peter S. Ruckman, God's servant. And that is where I stand with the Lord all the way. As to whether I am a good servant or a bad servant or a medium servant, that is his business. I call myself the Lord's junkyard dog because... A man who didn't particularly care for me told me once that I had the personality of a junkyard dog. It struck me as just being proper. It didn't bother me at all because he didn't know that I was from an army family of four generations, which included major generals, colonels and captains. He didn't know that the branch I, get, I came from in the infantry was called dog face. To prove it, we were all given dog tags. So I've always assumed that my job for the Lord was to stay in a junkyard where they threw away an old book nobody wanted. And when the Lord put me in here, he told me that I am his servant. I am his junkyard dog. Back there with the stuff people have thrown out, he said. Take care of my old book they've thrown out. If anybody climbs over the fence and tries to use it that doesn't believe it, bite the seat of his britches out. So that is what I've been doing now for 62 years. Number eight. Things I love and things I hate. I'm not a very good hater. I don't hate anybody enough to kill them. Sometimes I might have wished that maybe somebody would do it. But I do, uh, but I do hate nearly all members of the National Education Association for taking the Bible away from three generations of children and then teaching them sodomy in the primary grades. After they teach them about sodomy, abortions, easy divorces and race mixing, they fail to teach them how to read or write. Generations of young people with no character at all. I also hate all the so-called modern versions, something like 220 corrupt English versions. I know they must hate my book because they have changed it in more than 35,000 places, which is more than one change per verse. If you take all the changes that have been made in the RSV and the new RSV and the ASV and the new ASV and the IV and the NIV, just those, you would have 35,000 alterations from the King James text. I hate that junk and consider it stuff you would use for the cat to sit on or the birdcage. Things I love? If anyone would judge me by my actions or my conduct, conduct it would be pretty obvious. 
I love my wife and I, I am true to her and try to treat her right and supply all her needs so she doesn't have to get a job. I love all my children, although some of them didn't turn out the way I want them to be. But I love all my children, ten of them, and all my grandchildren, twenty of them, and all my great-grandchildren, eight of them, although I don't get along with a couple of the sons or one of the two grandchildren. But I don't hold it against them and don't bear them anything like hate. Then I love the book. And of course, you know what book I am talking about. The Bible says, Charity rejoiceth in truth, in the truth. The best thing I have on this earth, aside from the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, is the book that he left me. He said, He that is of God heareth God's words. He said, I came into the world to bear witness to the truth. If a man even makes an attempt to keep the first commandment, to love God, the next item he would have to love would be what he said, the truth. And that is what I love. I love the truth even when it is against me. Number nine. What are we heading into? If when you address me, you mean we Americans, I say that we are heading into a holocaust under martial law by a world dictator. I would say that the casualties from where we are headed headed to would make Hitler's holocaust look like a spring picnic. I believe that, um, that America hit rock bottom in 1901 when she exchanged the King James Bible for the ASV and then went down about a foot under the muck when FDR came in 1933. I believe that he was a genuine communist socialist just as Obama and that when he put, when he put part of his Supreme Court together he got in as many communists as he could get in and they have been with us ever since. We are not heading into something right now. We are in it. This is the last generation, as it is described in the book of Proverbs. This is the last generation before the devil's son, the son of perdition, the seed of the serpent, the man of sin, shows up. I wouldn't give us two years before he shows up. That's only a guess, so I don't know that. But I would give it about two years. We are living in these last days before the rapture. I believe we should occupy till he comes. And as Martin Luther said, one day when he was asked, when, when they asked him what he would do if he knew the Lord was coming tomorrow night, he said that he would go right on hoeing his little old patch of potatoes. I would go on trying to do something for the Lord, even though I'm not capable of doing it like I did before because of my bad eyes. I still do what I can, although I've had to give up nine classes at the school. I'm still teaching five Bible classes and still broadcasting on two radio stations. And I don't know how many places with the drawing men to Christ. Number 10. What did I miss out on? Whatever it was, I didn't miss it. And I don't miss it now. In my coming up, I was put through just about every kind of thing that you could imagine. Except I never got involved with drugs or sex perverts. But if there is anything else, sports, art, music, literature, travel, study, liars, crippled people, sick people, dying people, truck farm, gardening, painting, writing, playing musical instruments, going around the equator 75 times, 40,000 miles a year for 50 years, and the study of religions, the study of philosophy, the study of psychology, raising children, raising animals, teaching men how to kill each other, bartending, lifeguarding, dance bands, bluegrass bands, jazz combos, the mafia, the bank robbers, the kidnappers, the world leaders, cooking, sowing, ploughing, tilling, teaching, studying, fishing, hunting, sickness and good health, preaching, teaching, witnessing, court procedures, divorce decrees, marriage licence, etc, etc, etc. I've already been in the Osarks, Ozarks. I've already been in the Rockies. I've been on the top of the Zugs, Zugspites overseas and the Gross Glockner and the Blue Ridge Parkway, and the Smoky Mountains, and sunrise and sunset over Honolulu, sunset and sunrise over Manila, Philippines, sunrise and sunset over Korea, sunrise and sunset over Japan in Tokyo, and sunrise and sunset in Nuremberg, Germany, and in the Ukraine and Russia, and in Bombay and Hyberdad, Hyberdad, Hyberabad, in India. Then in and out of an average of 20 motels a year for more than 50 years, that includes taxi cabs and buses and tickets and baggage and checking in, checking out, eating from the menus in 40 states out of 42 states. If there's something I missed, I wouldn't be interested in going back to find it. If I had to die before the Lord came, you should put on my grave, God gave him a full cup and it ran over a long time ago. Number 11. What did I miss out on in living my life to the full? Answered in number 10. Number 12. My present thoughts on life. And with this he finishes. 
My present thoughts on life are thoughts that I got right before the time I got saved, the 14th of March, 1949. At that time I was ready to quit. At that time I was looking for a gun to kill myself and wound up stealing a Bible instead. But as far as my thoughts on life are, I have found life to be a tremendous adventure. Good and bad, rotten and wonderful, blessed and cursed. I find life to be, from an individual standpoint, an outstanding example of God giving a sinner a break after break after break that he didn't deserve, and reward after reward after reward that he didn't earn, and have let not handfuls of pur- purpose, but barrels full of purpose his way. For what reason, I know not. I just know that none of them were earned or deserved. They were given. Growing old has been a rotten experience and gets more rotten every day. But when I got saved, I was ready to quit then. I knew something back in 1949 which most Christians don't learn, even if they live to be 100 years old. I have learned that the answers are not down here, they are upstairs. People make fun of us and say, well, you're always talking about that pie in the sky. You bet your boot is, it is in the sky. It isn't down here. You say, how do you know? I have looked. And don't tell me that Ruckman hasn't looked. Don't give me that. When I was 28 years old, I knew that the answers were not down here. I knew all the problems, I just didn't have any answers. I painted a whole bunch of series of paintings when I was drunk called Psychopathic Symbols, Symbolisms, and I've kept about 15 of them. When I show them to people, they think I I was saved when I painted them because they are the biblical view of what I'm talking about. But I wasn't saved. I was drunk and unsaved. But I knew the problems before I was 30, and I was ready to quit at 28. I'm ready to quit right now. I know where the answer is. It's upstairs. It isn't down here. There may be blessings ahead or troubles ahead or pain ahead or whatever ahead, but I know one thing. It ain't down here. My prayer in the morning is, even so, come Lord Jesus. And at bed at night, even so, come Lord Jesus. I, in joking gesture, speaking of course, kid people about it, but I want to ask the Lord when I get to heaven if he, if he didn't make a mistake in waiting so long. Now, of course, I won't know what I'm talking about. And he will know what he is talking about, what he is doing. He always knows what he is doing. He is always right, and I know it. But there is one thing that God could not do. He could not come too soon for Pete Ruckman. I would say that if he came tonight, it would be, or it would be awful late for me, because I've known all along that the answer was not down here. I knew that as an unsaved man. I must confess that 62 years of living with the Lord was a sight better than the 28 years I lived for the devil. But I still know that there is nothing ahead down here but, for, but hospital beds and graves for any of us. The best is yet to come. And it doesn't come until he comes or until we go to him. That is my look on life. May the Lord bless you, brother, and keep up the good work. Sincerely in Christ, Dr. Peter S. Rockman. I think that's amazing. I think that's a fantastic testimony. I think the guy is a genius. There's not many lives that I've looked at um, or been jealous of in a good way, but Ruckman's is one of them. I don't know anybody that's achieved as much as he has, being honest with you. Um, And I love the guy. I think he's brilliant. One day we're going to see him face to face with all the other Christians that have gone on before us. And uh, he's poured his life, for 94 years he is now, he's poured his life into serving the Lord and reading his book. And I don't think there's a better Bible teacher, in my opinion, than Peter S. Ruckman. If you have your um, Bibles, we're going to be turning um, to a lot of different scriptures this morning. I just thought it was worth reading. I don't know how you found that, but I thought that was um, uh, issue 60, issue 60, 2012. Well, I'm going to speak to you on a subject. Do you want to get Amrick a glass of water? Because I think he's coughing like a seal. Um, We're going to talk about this morning, once saved, always saved. And I want you to understand that um, what the Bible talks about in regard to this. Once you become a Christian, are you saved forever, or can you lose, or can you lose your salvation? That's what we're going to be talking about this morning. And many Christians struggle over this issue, this question. Once saved, always saved. We've had Christians coming here, as you know, that um, believe that you could lose your salvation. And we're going to look at just a few scriptures and what the Bible actually teaches about this. If you can lose your salvation, how many sins does it take for you to lose it? And how do you know if you've lost 
your salvation, if you can. See what a mess you can get into? Yeah, a lot of Christians worry about this. For me, personally, I settled this a long time ago. And I now never, ever worry about losing my salvation. I have 100% complete peace. I am saved, I am saved for eternity, and I couldn't go to hell if I wanted to, as one preacher once said. And do you know how I settled this? Turn with me, please, to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, which says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I keep turning us week after week to this passage, to this scripture, because unless you rightly divide this book, you will never understand the scriptures. Because the key to understanding the Bible is found in 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You see, the Bible clearly teaches that you can lose your salvation, and the Bible clearly teaches that you can't lose your salvation. Is it a contradiction? No. You've just got to rightly divide the scriptures. And if you don't rightly divide the scriptures, you will teach heresy. And heresy is truth misplaced. That's what heresy is. That's why you have all these cults and isms and these fake religions all taking verses out of context and building their little empires. So if you believe and teach that you can lose your salvation, all you have done is you have taken a scripture, probably from Matthew, Acts, Hebrews, James, or the Old Testament, and you have misapplied it. That's all you've done. That's done enough for you to not have peace for the rest of your life by taking something out of context, and then you'll worry about it for the rest of your life. Christians who are deep in the scriptures, they study the Bible, they rightly divide the scriptures, these are the Christians that never worry about losing their salvation. They've they've got total peace about that issue. They may not be at peace about many other issues, they could be worried about loads of other things, but to think that they're never going to go to hell, they've got peace on that. So if this issue isn't settled with you this morning, I hope after this little talk, it will be. You see, I know, personally, I know where I am going when I die or if the rapture happens. I know that I am saved now. Nothing's going to stop me getting to heaven. Nothing. You can do anything you like. You can take me, you can imprison me, you can kill me, you can do whatever you like to me. But nothing's going to stop me from going to heaven. I'm bound for glory. In fact, mm, I'm spiritually there already. Turn to Ephesians 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's us. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. I certainly did. Just like Rockman said, he did. I did. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Spiritually speaking, I'm in heaven right now. Look at 1 John chapter 5. 1 John, chapter 5, verse 12. He that hath the Son hath life, 
And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. That's the whole meaning of life wrapped up in one verse with one syllable words. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. I know that I've got eternal life. Hath given. Note that. You see, one of God's gifts is eternal life. Look at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the Lord is not an Indian giver. He doesn't give it one minute and take it back the next. Romans 11.29 says, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. He doesn't change his mind. So God gives us the gift of eternal life. Now what you do with that is up to you. That's your free will. You can accept it or you can reject it. That's your choice. I know where I'm going. No matter who says what, I know that I've trusted in Jesus Christ for my sins forgiven. I know that I'm going to go to heaven when I die or when the rapture happens. I know that I'm saved. I know that I have eternal life. Now you can call that arrogance. You can call that big headedness, stubbornness, whatever. You can call me a deluded fool, whatever. But I know because of what the Bible says. Because the Bible is my final authority on all matters of faith and practice. And this book, this King James Bible, is 100% perfect. That's why I know. If your Bible's got mistakes in, I wonder what you know. Remember, works has nothing to do with your salvation, and therefore works has nothing to do with keeping it. Romans teaches us that you're saved by faith without works. Plus nothing, that's it. And Galatians teaches us that we're kept saved by faith without works. Plus nothing, that's it. We're saved, I'm saved. This morning I thank God I am. I haven't earned it. I haven't done anything to attain it, and therefore I can't do anything myself to keep it. I've received a gift, and that gift is Jesus Christ, and I'm a Christian. Jesus Christ has done everything for me. Took my sins, died in my place, was punished because of me, and I believe what he did. And he rose again the third day. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I trust what he says, and I trust this book. And I've applied his blood, his blood incorruptible, pure, perfect blood, spiritually speaking, to my life. And his blood's on the mercy seat in heaven right now. (coughs) Our salvation is based upon the acceptance of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, dying on Calvary's cross. You know what the gospel is. You know how to get saved. And the Lord has done it all. You've done nothing. No works, no baptism, no water, no sacraments, nothing. Just trust, perfect trust in what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Trust in the Lord. Salvation is not based on feelings. Our feelings go up and down. We've talked about stuff this morning. Our feelings go up and down. You can't wake up one morning thinking I'm saved or wake up one morning thinking I'm not saved. You you can think that, but that has no basis on any truth. That's your feelings. And your feelings can, you know, um, they can deceive you. No, my, my trust is in the Lord and my trust is in his word. You're either saved or you are lost. You're either a Christian or you're not. You're either in Christ or you're outside of Christ. There's no middle ground. There's no coming close. You're either in or you're out. Now you think about the pastors, the preachers, the teachers in pulpits all over the world this morning who believe that you can lose your salvation. How do they know that they're saved? 
Maybe they've thought something that, man, you know, perhaps I've lost my salvation. Yet they're preaching, they're preaching to the congregations and they're teaching their, you know, their people in their churches how to get saved. How mad is that? Salvation is a gift. Turn to Ephesians. Galatians, Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So this gift is the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you received him? The unspeakable gift? Have you received him this morning? Once you're in Christ, you can't fall out of Christ. And there is no amputation in the body of Christ. As Christians, we are part of Christ's body. Bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 30. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians Chapter 12, verse 13. For by one spirit are we all baptised into one body. We're baptised into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. We are in Christ. And being in Christ, we are predestinated. You're not predestinated to get saved, as the Calvinist teaches us. Romans 8, 29, look at this. For whom he did foreknow, foreknowledge, note that. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, which we touched upon this morning. That's what you're predestinated. Once you're in Christ, and you only get in Christ in time, not before Genesis 1.1, to be conformed to the image of his son, that ye might be the firstborn among many brethren. We raise up because Christ was resurrected. If I drop dead this morning, I'll go straight into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a peace that is, knowing that I'm saved, knowing where I'm going. I don't have to worry about keeping my salvation. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8. Verse 7 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. You see, salvation, salvation is eternal life. That's what it is. Getting saved, you get eternal life. You're never going to die. Your soul is going to have everlasting life. Oh, sure, you'll pass on from this life, but you're going to go into everlasting life. John 10, verse 28. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. We're talking about the assurance of salvation. Once you get saved, once you get in Christ, you're saved for eternity. Don't let anybody talk you out of that. Like I said before, if they try to, they're going to take you from Matthew, Acts, Hebrews, James, or the Old Testament to try and disprove this doctrine. They'll take verses out of context. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Two of the greatest verses showing about the assurance of salvation. Romans chapter 8 verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm saved for eternity. If you're a Christian, you can never lose your salvation. If you're truly saved this morning, you will never lose your salvation. It doesn't matter if you go off a tangent or you mess up or commit some heinous crime. You're saved for eternity. I'm not saying God won't punish you, maybe in this life, or you'll lose rewards at the judgment seat of Christ, but you're saved. So get peace about that this morning. Your righteousness can't save you. Your own righteousness 
It says filthy rags. That can't save you. Look at Luke 18 verse 9. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. You can't save yourself. Your righteousness is a stench. What you need, what I need, is the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. A perfect, perfect sacrifice. No blemish, no corruptible blood, the perfect sacrifice. I need Christ's righteousness, and so do you. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us. God the Father made Jesus Christ to be sin for us, who knew no sin. Jesus Christ never sinned. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So the righteousness of God is in Christ Jesus, and we accept, we receive that righteousness. And that's exactly, that's exactly what we need to do. John chapter 1, John chapter 1 verse 12, but as many as received him, that's what you've got to do, receive him, receive this gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not baptism, not works, not speaking in tongues, not sacrifice, uh, sacraments, you've got to receive this man. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Turn right, John 3, verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath, past tense, everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Present tense. The wrath of God is abiding on you if you're not a Christian. You are on death row awaiting your execution, waiting your judgment and execution. If you're not saved, that's what's going to happen. You'll be judged and your execution will be everlasting death. But if you're a Christian, you have everlasting life. Spiritually, you're in heaven already. You're just awaiting the redemption of your body. So, the last thing you want to do is trust your feelings. You can think you're the vilest sinner on earth, and that's good to feel, being honest with you. Keeps you humble. And you can mess up in your life, keep doing the same old things, and God may judge you and punish you because of it. Because as a, as a, a father to a son, he loves you, and he wants what's best for you. And sometimes punishment is best for us. So we wake up and we understand. Some, you know, why do good things, bad things happen to good people? Listen, sometimes we need bad things to happen, to bring us low, to break us, to change us, to keep our eyes focused on the Lord, to get us to take our eyes off the world and back on the Lord. Sometimes things need to happen like that. If you could keep focused on the Lord, you'd be okay. But we find it difficult so often. So many distractions and attractions in this life. So don't trust your feelings. Trust the word of God. We know we are saved. And we are eternally secure because of the witness of the Holy Spirit. That's another way of knowing. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 verse 16. The Spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Holy Spirit speaks peace to our souls and we know that we belong to Jesus Christ. We don't worry about that. We don't worry about I don't worry about losing my salvation. I worry about losing my fellowship with the Lord because of the sins that I commit in my life and I break my fellowship with the Lord but I'm still his son because he's done everything. But I don't worry about losing my salvation. We also have the assurance of salvation by what the word of God says. The Bible is the infallible, inerrant words of God. Look at John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, I do, hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life now if you go back to john 3 we looked at verse 36 look at verse 18 he that believeth on him is not condemned i'm not condemned but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of god look at acts chapter 13 Acts chapter 13, rushing you through this morning, so much to get through. Acts 13, 39, and by him all that believe are justified 
from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. By believing on him, I'm justified. By believing on him, I'm justified. I'm sanctified. I'm redeemed. (coughs) I'm just awaiting the redemption of my body. And that comes at the rapture. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, verse 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life. Past tense, that is. Passed from death unto life. How? By believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. We know we have passed from death unto life. I know it. I've got the spirit. It's witnessing with my spirit inside. I have a peace. I don't have to worry about going to hell. I know I'm saved. You can't talk me out of my salvation. I tell you that now. No matter what scriptures you would use. I'm saved for eternity. And this is why it is so, so, so important to have a book that you can trust. 100%. Because as I've said, and some of you have been on the receiving end of this perhaps, but as I've said, if this book's got errors in, then you cannot trust it. And if you can't trust it, how do you know you're saved? So get yourself a Bible that is perfect. And that is this authorised version King James Bible. The old-fashioned book. (laughs) If you don't have a perfect Bible, you have nothing. You have no standard. And just by believing, listen, just by believing, just by believing, won't save you. Or will it? Think carefully. Judas Iscariot. Judas believed. Judas repented. Judas confessed. Judas was baptised. And Judas went to hell. You make sure you're saved. You need to receive Jesus Christ as your personal saviour. As your personal saviour. It's not about believing in God. It's not about believing in Jesus. The JWs believe in Jesus. The Christadelphians. Islam believes in Jesus. It's about receiving him as your personal saviour. Your personal saviour. You've asked the Lord Jesus Christ into your life to forgive you of all your sins. You've trusted what he's done. The only thing that's keeping you out of hell is Jesus Christ. So you put in all your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ that he took your sins, died in your place, and you're putting your faith and trust in him. You're a vile, hell-deserving sinner, just like me. And all I have done is put my faith totally, implicitly in Jesus Christ. And I'm saved. But you think about that with Judas Iscariot. And you find out this morning whether you are saved. Have you got peace? Do you know that you are saved for eternity? You need to receive Jesus Christ as your personal saviour. That's it. What on earth would make you doubt your salvation. Think about that one. What makes you doubt your salvation? Are you reading the word of God? Some Christians don't read this book from one week to the next. Of course you can have doubts. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith, you want more faith, you read the Bible. Christians say, well I haven't got the faith like you have. Then read the Bible. It isn't difficult. It's simple. It's just hard to do. Because there's so many distractions and attractions throughout every day. You make time for this book. You make time for God. You read the Bible. You note down questions. You ask questions. On a Friday night we have an interactive Bible study. Throw a question out. Confuse us all. (laughs) Let's look at the scriptures. Let's get into the scriptures. But study the book. What makes you doubt your salvation? I wonder. Listen, just to finish up with, I want to give you some other great verses that show you that once you are saved, you're saved for eternity. In this dispensation, in this time period, you know, the, the, um, the church aid preceding the rapture, you cannot lose your salvation. But in the Old Testament you could. In the tribulation you can. 
But not now. Look at 1 Corinthians. Look at this. 1 Corinthians. Chapter 3. Verse 11. Look at this. Verse 11 to 15. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. This is the judgment seat of Christ. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Everything you do for the Lord Jesus Christ, you get a reward for. If any man's work shall be burned, if any man's work, note that, shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be, what? Saved. Yet so as by fire. You cannot lose your salvation. The Bible says clearly, at the judgment seat of Christ, you can lose your rewards. If you haven't lived for Jesus Christ as you should, you will lose rewards. If you're not living for Jesus Christ as you should now, you could get things happen in this life. To lay you low. Things could happen. Your, your life could take a downturn because God's trying to get through to you. God wants to use you and work through you to reach other lost souls. God would even take some Christians home early because they're not doing what they should be doing. Bear that in mind. But at the judgment seat of Christ, you lose your rewards, not your salvation. Look at another one. Nearly through. Ephesians, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. You are sealed, you're waiting for your body to be redeemed, but you're sealed of God by the Holy Spirit, you're sealed and no, nothing and no one, not principalities, not power, is going to break that seal. God has sealed you. You are saved. You're in the Lord's hands and the Lord is in his Father's hands. Nobody's going to get at you and you're going to lose your salvation. You're saved for eternity. Look at Philippians. Philippians 1. Philippians 1 verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He started in you, you're saved, he's going to perform a good work in you. He's going to see it all the way through. He don't give up, and because he doesn't, you're saved. Colossians 1, verse 20 to 22. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile, to reconcile all things unto himself by him, I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and their enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled, you've been reconciled, in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. He's going to present you unblameable, unre unreprovable in his sight. You have been saved for eternity. Now listen, we've dealt with this on a number of issues. We've done sermon after sermon on it. We've touched on a number of different sermons in the past. We've also, in issue 31, pages 1 to 5 of Time for Truth News, there's a study on it as well, if you're still not sure. I've just taken a few scriptures this morning to show you that once you become a Christian, you are saved. Once you become a Christian, you have everlasting life, eternal life. And you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And you can never lose your salvation. So quit worrying about it and study the book and keep reading. And if there is a verse that is teaching you that you can lose your salvation, know this, it's not for this dispensation. Matthew, Acts, James, Hebrews and the Old Testament will throw you every time if you're trying to apply stuff from those books 
into this dispensation in regard to your salvation. I'm not saying that there is no doctrine in those books for the church age. I'm not saying that, because there is. I'm not a hyper-dispensationist. I'm a balanced Christian. <laughs> I promise you. <laughs> but we've got to rightly divide the word of truth, and that's the key to understanding the Bible. I was blessed this morning by reading Rockman's testimony. By reading Rockman's, um, uh, the article that he's put in the newsletter. I loved it. I love the man. I love him. And, that, and I've learned more through him, the Holy Spirit revealing you know, his word through this guy than any other guy. He's a, he's a genius. He's brilliant at what he does. And I hope that he makes it to the rapture because I'd love to go up with him at the rapture. I hope it's today. They keep talking about it, you know, everybody's talking about it, it seems. I hope it is. But until then, we've got to be faithful to the Lord, to his word. Pray for each other. Pray for Peter Rutman. Pray for me. I pray for you. And let's keep faithful to this book. Keep preaching and teaching and reaching the lost with the gospel until we see him face to face. And don't give up. And throw your, if you've got, you know, throw all your energy and your soul, everything you've got, your body, soul, mind, your money, everything you've got, throw into the, getting the gospel out and reaching the lost. Because we're going to stand face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ very, very soon. And you don't want to have any regrets, folks. Let us pray.